as uh, <clears throat> mentioned earlier, we certainly want to uh, thank everyone for joining us in this class uh, by means of Zoom. We should be thankful for technology and use it to extend the uh, borders of the kingdom. <clears throat> so grateful for that, grateful to have you here. And we're in a study of uh, logic, getting close to the end of it. <clears throat> but uh, probably a couple more weeks and we'll be through with it. Before we get involved in it though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Just bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time that we can gather together by this means to engage in this study, knowing that the uh, techniques that we learn here will better prepare us to, to uh, rightly divide thy word and to assess what others are saying about thy word. So we appreciate the study and appreciate the uh, truths that are contained in here. We un understand, Father, that all logic is derived from thee. Uh, they are the, uh, the posture of truth. All truth is derived from thee, and therefore logic is uh, uh, one of the, the natures. We're thankful for that and thankful that we can participate in that. Be with us now as we engage in this study and be with all who love thee and love thy son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, we really finished up uh, last week. Let me share the screen. We finished up uh, last week this particular slide, which was quite a, a long slide, hypothetical syllogisms. But what I would uh, like to do is go over it very quickly and then get on with uh, other slides. So if you happen to have this slide available, you, know, you can um, follow along or you can just follow the uh, screen as I scroll through it. But hypotheticals are uh, if-then statements. And the, the uh, pure hypothetical is if P then Q and if Q then R and therefore if P then R. And of course, we use symbols. It's a quicker way of writing. That uh, use symbol laying on the side with the open end to the left, that means if then. <clears throat> so if P, then Q, if Q, then R. Therefore, assuming that the first two are correct, therefore, if P, then R. So you can go through the uh, examples that are given here, but I want to point out that in these uh, statements, uh, the uh, categorical statement after the if appears, if I study, I study is a categorical statement. That's the antecedent. That's what, what goes before. And then the statement after the then, that's also a categorical statement. I will get good grades. That's a consequent of the antecedent. So you just uh, keep that in mind. Sometimes you can get these wrong. You, you look at hypothetical syllogism that can be invalid. Uh, mixed hypotheticals. Uh, and when you get into logic, you'll run across the, the modus ponens and the uh, Modus Tollens. And I'll have a lesson here towards the end of the month, and I'll be mentioning Modus Ponens. So, but anyway, 
<clears throat> and they're they're complements of each other or, or uh, counters of each other. The uh, modus ponens is if P, then Q. You know, if I study, then I get good grades. I study P, therefore, I get good grades. And that's a modus ponens. You put it in uh, a symbolic uh, uh, nomenclature. It's if P, then Q, P, therefore, Q. And you can look at the uh, other examples. Modus tollens is the opposite of modus opponents. If P, then Q. But it's not Q. Therefore, it's not P. And put in everyday language, if I study P, I'll get good grades. I did not get good grades. Therefore, I didn't study. In the symbolic language, it'd be uh, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. And there are two fallacies, because we'll get into fallacies uh, coming up shortly. First fallacy, fallacy is affirming the consequence. Remember, the consequence is the uh, what comes after the then. So it would say if P then Q, and you have the symbolic language over here. So we're affirming Q. Therefore, P, if P then Q, we're affirming the Q, therefore P. And you can look at the example there. Uh, we can, also look at the invalid argument. If I study P, that's the antecedent, then I get a good grade. That's a consequent Q. I got a good grade, therefore I study, but this is a non sequitur. You know, that's just Latin term means it doesn't follow. Uh, and here's an example where it doesn't follow. If you were a gorilla, P, that's the antecedent, then you would have two legs, that's a consequence. You have two legs, therefore you must be a gorilla. A uh, gorilla, that's uh, non sequitur, didn't follow. The other fallacy is denying the antecedent. Remember up above, we affirm the consequence. Now we're denying the antecedent. And here it, uh, here's how it uh, goes. If P, P is the antecedent, then Q. Well, we're uh, denying the antecedent, not P, therefore not Q. And real life example is if I study P, then I get good grades. And I did not study not P, therefore I will not get good grades, not Q. This is a non sequitur because it just doesn't follow. Then we get other reasons. Why you didn't get in grades again using the gorilla example if you were a gorilla then you'd have two legs you're not a gorilla therefore you do not have two legs See, it just doesn't follow and you can look at uh, this little chart here and these are the common symbols and you can just make notation of that you don't have to memorize that at all but here's an exercise <clears throat> And this has, goes through the definitions. A hypothetical statement is a statement that affirms an outcome based on a condition. It has the form if P then Q. That's the uh, hypothetical. A pure hypothetical syllogism is, is an argument that uses only hypothetical statements. The antecedent of a hypothetical statement is the condition, the part following the if. The consequent is the result of the condition, the part after the then. And a mixed hypothetical syllogism is, is an argument that uses both hypothetical and categorical statements. In the Latin phrase, of course, non sequitur means it doesn't follow that, you know, argument is invalid. 
So let's uh, look at these uh, examples here. If you're lazy, that's the phrase, uh, the categorical statement after the if, that's the antecedent, then you will be poor. That's the consequence. Henry is poor and it follows that he is lazy. So we affirm the consequence. Remember the you will be poor is uh, a consequence. We affirm that Henry's poor. So he's lazy. That can be a, a valid uh, argument. Not necessarily, but it can be. <clears throat> the Bible teaches that if a man is generous, that's a uh, antecedent if a man is generous, then he will prosper. That's a consequence of being generous. And we know that Mike is not generous, therefore he cannot prosper. Well, that's invalid because there can be other reasons he, he, he prospers. He can be the laziest person ever was but uh, he still may prosper. Denying the antecedent. If you speak too much, sin will not be absent. If sin is not absent, then it is present. Thus, if you speak uh, too much, sin is present. So this is a pure hypothetical. We got ifs, ifs, and ifs. Even the conclusion is an if. So it's pure hypothetical. <clears throat> and fourth one is if a ministry is of God, that's the antecedent that comes after the if, then it will succeed. The ministry will succeed. And that's a consequence. The Mormon church is successful. So we're affirming the consequence and we conclude that it is blessed by God. <clears throat> well, that's affirming the consequence, but it, of course, is uh, uh, you, you have to prove those uh, antecedent and the uh, consequence. You have to prove the uh, Mormon church is successful. You have to define successful. And yet find what uh, can be blessed by God. So you have to approve the premises. So that makes it invalid. Or an unsound uh, premise. Number five, if you are kind to the poor, that's the antecedent. Then you are lending to the Lord. That's the consequence. Paul is kind to the poor. He is therefore lending to the Lord. That's the consequence. So modus ponens. If P, then Q. If uh, uh, kind of the poor. P is the uh, antecedent. Q is the consequence. So for, so it's a modus ponens. If, if P, then Q. P. Therefore, Q. And the modus tollens is if you visit your neighbor too much, that's the antecedent, he will get sick of you, consequence. My neighbor is not sick of me, that's the consequence. So I don't think that I visit too much. That's the modus tollens form, which is the EFP, then Q, not Q. Therefore, not P. Number seven, if you don't answer a fool according to his folly, that's the antecedent, then he will think he was wise. <clears throat> you have the if then. Sharon did not answer him that way. That's the antecedent. He must think he is wise. That's the consequence. You know, remember, modus ponens is if Q, then Q, P, therefore Q. Number eight, if, if a country is rebellious, that's the antecedent, 
it has many rulers as the consequent mob rule, if you will. Argentina has many rulers, that's a consequence. It must be a rebellious country. So you've affirmed the consequence there. Nine, if a man is lawless, antecedent because it follows the if, even, we could say then his prayers, but even his prayers are detestable, that's a consequence. Larry is not, not at all a lawless man, antecedent. So his prayers must not be detestable. That's a consequence. So he's, we're denying the antecedent. If you're willing, number 10, antecedent, you can make me clean. Or we could say, then you can make me clean. That's a consequence. I am willing, Jesus said, that's the antecedent, be clean, that's a consequence. That's a modus ponens. If P then Q, P, therefore Q. Number 11, if recycling, recycling were necessary, antecedent, then it would be profitable, that's a consequence. Recycling is not yet profitable, consequence. So it must not be necessary antecedent. This is the modus tollens, which is if P then Q is not Q, therefore is not P. If a man gives gifts, that's the antecedent, then everyone one wants to be his friend, consequence. Everyone wants to be Gordon's friend consequence, and Gordon must uh, give out a lot of gifts, antecedent. So we have affirmed the consequence. <clears throat> Number 13, if you receive, if they receive you, they receive me. If they receive me, then they receive him who sent me. So if they receive you, then uh, they receive him who sent me. And that's a pure hypothetical. 14, if you kill antecedent, then you will die, consequence. I promise that I will never kill you, antecedent. Therefore, you will never die, consequence. So we're denying the antecedent, I will not kill you. <clears throat> Therefore, you will not die. 15, if you flog a mocker antecedent, then the simple will learn prudence, consequence. We don't flog mockers antecedent. That must be why we have so many imprudent people, consequence. So we're denying the antecedent. We don't, uh, therefore, we don't have many imprudent people. 16, if you are rich, antecedent, then many will want to be your friend, consequence. No one wants to be Jessica's friend. That's a consequence. She must not be rich, antecedent. That's a modus tollens, which is if P, not Q, therefore not P. If you honor the Lord with your wealth, antecedent, then he will bless you greatly, consequence. Spencer has always honored the Lord this way, antecedent. He will be blessed, consequence. That's a modus ponens, if P, then Q. P, therefore Q. If you fear the Lord, antecedent, then you will love wisdom, consequence. A man who hates wisdom, consequence, must not fear the Lord. So it's modus tollens, if P, then Q, <clears throat> but it's not Q, Q is negative, therefore it's not P.
P is negative. 19, if you are a Christian antecedent, then you will read your Bible, consequence. I know a man who reads the Bible, consequence. He must be a Christian antecedent. So here we're assuming the consequence. <clears throat> 20, if they had belonged to us, antecedent, they would have remained with us, consequence. But they went out from us, consequence. Thus, they, now this showed that they did not belong to us. The modus of Collins, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. <clears throat> and you can, uh, if you'd like, make a copy of this. <clears throat> we'll skip that since that's really a, a the other one. <clears throat> so uh, we've uh, up to this point been concerned with analysis that is determined the validity or invalidity invalidity of these existing arguments. Uh, this is in keeping with what uh, Dorothy Sayers had uh, said. Now I, I, I've uh, attached another article here which you should have and we're not going to go over it. But this is from uh, uh, Woodrow uh, Got his name now, <laughs> but anyway, he wrote a book uh, called "The uh, Change Agents in the Church of Christ." Woodson, but he, in his introduction there, he quoted this Dorothy Sayers, and he calls her, her an ethicist of a time during the oh between the World Wars. Yeah, what she really was was a uh, what do you? call a writer of who done it's a mystery writer that that was her uh, genre but she was also she spoke on these ethical issues and she wrote this uh, or gave a speech called creed and, and K or chaos and she was talking about uh, what brought it about was the uh, event uh, taking place in Germany so it, it's a good read I'm, I'm not going to go over it, but you can uh, uh, go over that yourself. But anyway, but uh, this is what, you know, determine the validity or invalidity of existing arguments. This is keeping with what uh, Dorothy Sayers states in her essay on classical education. She wrote more than just uh, uh, mystery novels and the lost tools of learning. And uh, she was quoted in William Woodson's book, which I've attached. <clears throat> she writes, indeed, the practical utility of formal logic today lies not so much in the establishment of positive conclusions as in the prompt detection and exposure <clears throat> of invalid inference. <clears throat> Still, there is a um, value in being able to establish positive conclusions. For example, when we need to prove uh, the resolution in a debate. And we have all the tools we need to do this. If you go back, all we've gone through, you'll have the tools to do this. So we can take a given statement and we can place it as a conclusion of an argument and we can find a value, valid argument form that can be used to establish the conclusion. So remember I gave the, there was a slide on the 256 possible argument forms. And uh, uh, I guess you have, but anyway, of those 256, only 24 are valid. And I've uh, put those here. So each figure has six, valid form. 
So any of these forms may be used to establish a valid conclusion. So if you're taking a conclusion, you, you want to put it in one of these forms that, to make it valid, that is. Take, for example, a claim that angels have limited knowledge. Uh, that's a conclusion. Assume that you wanted to prove this claim in a debate or just to yourself. We can use this uh, following a procedure. We can put the statement into to be established into standard categorical form. The uh, given statement would be something like uh, this. Make this a little larger. All angels are beings with limited knowledge. Now this is a universal affirmative or an A statement if you look at your square of opposition. So we want to find a valid, a valid argument uh, considering the mood and figure that has that type of statement in the conclusion. The only argument form that has a, an A statement as a conclusion is A, A, A-1. So we must use this form for our argument. So we'll place the statement as the conclusion of this A, A, A form of syllogism. And we'll fill, fill in the known term, uh, living, uh, leaving, leaving the middle term blank. <clears throat> Remember, the middle term is not in the conclusion. So all blank are beings with limited knowledge and all angels are blank. Therefore, all angels are beings with limited knowledge. So we have to find the middle term. So we find a middle term <clears throat> that makes the premises true that's completing the argument. So what is something that all angels are at the same time as a being with limited knowledge? Since it is the case that only God has unlimited knowledge and God is not created, then any being that is not God, that is a created being, has limited knowledge. Since all angels are created beings, the term created being becomes our middle term. So the final argument becomes all created beings are beings with limited knowledge. All angels are created beings. Therefore, all angels are beings with limited knowledge. So that works. Uh, let's uh, go through another example. Uh, let's suppose you want to prove the following resolution. Not all killing of another person is murder. And we've been through this uh, a number of times, so you know what the answer is. <clears throat> so our first step is to put the statement into a categorical form. Uh, some killing of a person is not murder. Now, this is an O statement. And again, refer to the square of opposition. And there are many valid syllogism forms that have that type of statement as their conclusion. So, you know, it might be just easier to jump to the next step and consider a middle term that may work in this case, a killing that is not murder. Well, what type of killing is not murder? Well, murder is properly defined as a unlawful killing of, of some law, either civil law, criminal law, or God's law. So we need to provide an example of killing that is not unlawful, such as a lawful execution of a criminal. With this in mind, uh, think of true statements that connect the execution of a criminal to the two terms in the conclusion, the killing of a person and murder. Well, clearly the execution of a criminal is the killing of a person. This, uh, but, 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 you know, one that's properly adjudicated and uh, properly performed execution, then they're not murder. That does not constitute murder. So this gives us a no statement 
as a major premise, uh, namely, some executions are not murder. It is the major premise because it contains the major term murder. And an A statement as the minor premise, all executions are the killing of a person. And so this gives the following argument, an O, A, O, there's three form. Some executions are not murder. All executions are the killing of a person. Therefore, some killing of a person is not murder. And O, O, A, O, dash three form is one of the valid forms set forth above. Uh, above. Therefore, this is a valid form. If the premises are true, and we have to establish that, the uh, argument, the form of the argument establishes that the conclusion is true. So let's uh, just uh, go through this quickly. Uh, develop sound syllogisms that establish uh, this given statements as a conclusion using the suggestion method and figure in parentheses. And I'll, I'll let you go through this, but it'd just be a good exercise for you. And you need to put it in like the first one, everyone in heaven is happy. You need to put it in AAA dash one form and so forth and so on. And as I say, this be a good exercise for you. We're, we're not going to uh, go through it. Let's look at the fallacies and see if we get the fallacies. We won't get through it this week, likely. There are a number of uh, fallacies, and we'll go through that as we go through this, even though we're, uh, first of all, we're considering the fallacies of distraction. Using what we have learned from our pre previous studies, we can distinguish between valid and invalid syllogisms. And we've had some practice in uh, constructing valid uh, syllogisms. Uh, so let's look at uh, some informal logic. And we consider the use and identification of informal fallacies. And they're popular informal, informal forms of reasoning that despite their popularity are invalid or unhelpful. Studying and responding to such casual mistakes make up an important part of what we may be described as uh, street fighting logic. And I know that, uh, you know, in your daily uh, conversation and reading and you know, whatever you do on media and stuff like that, you're going to run through fallacies all the time. So in learning street fighting logic, <clears throat> first thing to do is make some distinctions. Uh, we distinguish uh, one, fallacies of distraction, then fallacies of ambiguity, and then finally fallacies of form, and we can go over each of these. Uh, the fallacies are no longer Euclidean logic. And one should soon notice that fallacies of ambiguity could, if one was so inclined, uh, just be considered distracting. These uh, categories are for sake of convenience, not for uh, proclaiming an absolute authoritative classification. You may be able to come up with some other fallacy forms. Please note that these are fallacies depending upon how they are used. Therefore, it is possible to reason rightly while using some of these arguments. Some may consider them fallacies in each and every situation, but human reasoning in practice takes much of its meaning from the context. This means that these uh, forms of uh, 
argument cannot be handled as though they were detached from real life situations. Initially, we considered some of these fallacies of distraction, which are arguments that point us to information that seems relevant to the conclusion, but are not relevant. The attempt is to show how each of the informal fallacies can either be a fallacy or not. So how can we tell the difference? Well, we have to use our whole noggin, use our wisdom. So here are the uh, various forms that we may or may not get through with them tonight. Ipsy uh, Dix, Dixit, and this is Latin for he has said it himself. So this fallacy is committed when an illegitimate appeal is made, is made to authority. And this takes the form of uh, X says this and that and thus and such must therefore be the the case. Or if P says it, then Q must be there. P does in fact say it, therefore Q. And some people would call this counting noses. Now this is modus ponens. And then, you know, go back and look at the uh, hypothetical syllogisms. And is therefore valid. So how can it be valid and yet a fallacy? And you need to remember this is street logic. The issue is the legitimacy of the appeal. The argument is valid, but in sound is the premise is false. If the authority is legitimate and relevant, then there is no fallacy at all. If not, then it is an instance of Ipsy Dixit. He has said it himself. So the Ipsy Dixit, Ipsy Dixit, Henry Schwartz says there is no creator, therefore there is no creator. And not the Ipsy Dixit, the Bible says God is the creator, therefore God is the creator. The difference is the uh, if you want to say the authority of the authority, the reliability of the authority. Henry Schwartz, um, he may think it, he, he may be a liar, he may have other purposes, but God is no liar. Uh, all that he said is truth, so God is the creator. Second one is ad populum. In this fallacy, it means a, an appeal to the masses. What makes it a fallacy is that the appeal is made to the mere mass of the masses or the number, if you will, rather than to specific aspects of my, mankind possessed by the masses to which one may make a legitimate appeal. <clears throat> uh, when an appeal such as uh, mom, all my friends are doing it, and when that's made, and who hasn't seen that, now this fallacy is committed. So the ad populum, uh, the book must be truly great. You can say that about a movie or anything. It must be a best bestseller. And not the ipsy populum, or the ad, I should say the ad populum, got that wrong there. I'll make a little note there. It's not the ad populum. Everyone has found the Bible to be a profitable book. Uh, you should uh, read it too. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be going over all over time. So next week, let's uh, pick up with the uh, three, the uh, ad uh, vacuum. We'll continue on with these appeals. You may look at these for next week. So thank you for your attention to it. Hope it's been profitable to you.